welcome to the third day of the lecture i'll uh, invite uh, uh, dr sunil to introduce a speaker of the day dr ev untoro dr sunil over to you uh, good morning to all today welcome to the third day of the series of the forensic odontology lectures today i'd like to introduce our eminent personality in the field of forensic odontology dr ev untoro from indonesia he is a forensic pathologist also trainee in forensic anthropology forensic genetics dna and forensic radiology she is a member of indian national dvi team since 2000 indonesian banting province dvi team since 2016 she is an advanced team of forensic pathology and forensic anthropology working groups in the whole dvi team since 2017 She is a president of Indian Indonesian region of Indo-Pacific Association of Law, Medicine and Science since 2013. A member of Asian Pacific Medical Legal Agency since 2013, and International Academy of Legal Medicine since 2011, and a board member of Association for Forensic Odontology of Human Rights since 2019. She has got a vast experience. working in private and government hospitals in policy cases in forensic cases around asia pacific she has created of many publication of articles in forensic books researchers in forensic dna database of indonesian and asian on alle frequency of covid s13 of indonesian dna database she has interviewed and starred in the forensic movies regularly up to in Indonesia she has 5 years of experience since 2005 to 2010 in identification of okay. japanese soldiers human remains of world war 2 victims of missing action in papua and mokassar indonesia from the permission and intervention of japanese government and japanese embassy or in indonesia adding more knowledge and skills performance in forensic work i welcome uh, dr ive wontro to deliver her lecture starting namaste um here is a um... okay wait a moment ah okay here the in the core protocol guide of dbi procedure in mortuary um The background is uh, from 1984. Actually, the Interpol already making this uh, kind of um, guidelines of the disaster victim identification. And as we see that disaster is uh, we have is uh, natural and natural. Uh, the natural is because the mountain eruption, the um, the tsunami, the earthquake, and the unnatural is because the ba- the bombing and the fire and everything. And uh, because of this. is um and is sometimes the the victim is multinational like in the the bali bombing the first bali bombing and second bali bombing in indonesia we have this multinational uh victims so that's why we need to cooperate uh with within the all the countries that uh they have the missing person in that disaster so that's why we need the guidelines of universal standard we made this DBI Interpol guideline protocols to make everybody have the same, the same perfection, the same uh, um, notes on the victim. So we can we can uh, we can exchange or we can we can do the matching of the missing person within the country and country. And here natural and natural we call it the man-made, and it be open disaster, open disaster. It could be we call it last time back and also the tsunami we we everybody we we uh, uh, on the uh, become the victim on that open field or the close disaster is just like the uh, air place and also the fire in one disaster but sometimes it could could be combined the combination of disaster it could be first is the airplane crash but going to the habitat of the community so it will be uh, a victim it money as of the, the the passenger and also the victim could be the the 
season of the places itself. So it could be usually uh, uh, closed, it's very um, more easier vacation of the missing person, but also the, the open is uh, a little bit difficult and also the home is more difficult because everybody coming to answer more some office to us and um, uh, collecting the data of the, the missing person to us. So it's too much. But we can manage if we have so many uh, people in our team. And here, the international standard of identification. Um, there is also ICRC already having a, a public, publish their management of this body after disaster. Usually it's for the first line uh, responder because we usually uh, disaster happen is um, the first line people, the people who are still alive over there or survive, they also doing that, um, uh, moving the, the body to the proper place before us, the team of the DVI team who coming to the place itself. And then uh, the, the second is the Interpol. We're going to talk about the Interpol uh, guide today. But it's only um, uh, uh, about the, the procedure in the mortuary. Here, uh, as we know that the DVI phase, we have four DVI phase. First is the scene, uh, the, the, the places that are happening, the disaster. And then the phase two is the post-mortem, where our uh, DVI team in the mortuary uh, are waiting for the, the body bag or the human remains is coming to our mortuary. Uh, they, they're taking it from the scene. Uh, and then we have phase three is the anti-mortem. Actually, it's can doing uh, in the same time, but in the different office. And we help that um, when we have this disaster operation, we, we set up uh, one place where we should put the uh, that body for identification. And then in that one complex of the places, we put the anti-mortem uh, office for the family, the colleague, the friends, and also the employer maybe, who can come to, to make a report of their missing person. And uh, uh, it's not, please don't make it too, too close each other with the post-mortem or the mortuary or the morgue, and uh, also the container of the freeze uh, uh, refrigerator uh, with the anti-mortem office. The, usually, we in Indonesia, in, uh, in Jakarta, we put the anti-mortem uh, room is um, about maybe 100 or 200 meters from the, the post-mortem area. Or maybe on the, the, in the front of the complex, and we are the mortuary is the back of the complex. And then uh, after that, we're doing the phase four, uh, which is reconciliation. Reconciliation, we do the, the matching of the, the data of what we have in the, uh, in the mortuary and also what we have in the um, anti-mortem uh, data collection from the office. So uh, from the, the report of the data, uh, collection data from the missing person, and we match it with our uh, data in the mortuary. So this is uh, what we call it the victim data. We get it from the scene and the post-mortem. And also the missing person data, we got it from the phase three or antemortem office. Through the identification by reconciliation, matching the antemortem data and postmortem data. And after that, we can release if it is matched. In a, we do the reconciliation within the discussion with all the whole team. So uh, from the forensic pathology, forensic uh, odontology, forensic anthropology, and the DNA. A laboratory or even sometimes the toxicology and also from the photograph we get and uh, if it is matched and uh, we see that the primary and secondary uh, identification and then we can do the release so uh, the the release is uh, uh, the primary identification as we know in Interpol guide is uh, uh, fingerprinting which is the forensic odontologist doing the report on it, uh, the dental chart and uh, the, the picture of the x-ray or panoramic picture, or even uh, right now we have so many people doing the selfies picture in the Facebook. So the, the, the uh, family, the friends or the employer 
uh, can can send it to us and we can match it um, uh, from the superimposition or something That's with good. the dental picture. So, and the third is the DNA. I'm sorry, uh, I hope my sound still audible. Uh, could you kindly mute your microphone because uh, we're going to make the, the more smooth to be to be heard. And uh, at last, uh, after we have this primary identification, we also have the secondary identification, such as we, we take a report or the data from the jewelry, they have the earring, bracelet, or the ring, or the watches, and then also the shirt, and the trouser, and the shoes, and everything. And then uh, all also they maybe have the medical uh, uh, personal uh, data, like uh, they having this implant, or, or having this uh, um, uh, the birth um, what we call it the sign from the birth is a uh, also the tattoo also the mole and um, uh, other doc documents that we found it near the the dead bodies. So um, when we do the release versus the primary identification, even once is matched, uh, such as uh, from pinion printing, we got the data and the database. From Indonesia, we got the fingerprinting. When we going to, uh, we have a uh, uh, 17 years old. We got our uh, personal ID. Uh, we have to record our iris and we have to record our fingerprint. So uh, also, we if we make the passport, we also have to record the ten of our fingerprint. So. From that, uh, uh, the primary identification within the fingerprint, we can we can um, we can uh, do the the identification on the missing person. Or the second is the dental, uh, and then also the third is the DNA. We we would like to do the personal identification of DNA also if we cannot uh, the 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 family cannot provide us with the personal belonging and that having the DNA on the per missing person. So we take it from the paternity DNA to find out the, the, the DNA missing person. And then after it match, one of them, of the primary identification within is it the fingerprint or the dental or the DNA, we can release the dead bodies. But if we, we cannot find it, we can do the secondary identification within that we call it the jewelry, the medical data, or even the tattoo and the mole. But we need two, at least two, secondary identification to make it uh, identified for the missing person itself. And then after that, we're going to be released. And here, uh, we call it the yellow and the pink form. The yellow form is the antemortem form data. And then the pink form is the postmortem uh, data or the form that we use it, the pink form, in the mortuary. And the yellow form, we do it in the antemortem office. But if you're not going to make it a color full, you can also make it in the form is the white, like usual uh, paper we use. But it's uh, more easier we, uh, when we do the, the matching or the reconciliation, we can see the difference. But also right now, we also make uh, some of the country also make the report in digital. So it can be more easier to do the matching. Here, uh, it's also because uh, every year we have this meeting in Interpol. I am one of the subgroup of uh, working group of the forensic anthropology and forensic pathology of Interpol for the DVI team. So uh, this is uh, from the Netherlands. We do the revision of the DVI Interpol protocol every five, uh, three to five years. So after uh, we always have the meeting and then uh, in the meeting we we always have the discussion. How can we make this more easier for people and how for the people in the expert in the, in the identification, of course. And then uh, how, how can we make it uh, simpler? Or uh, is there any update? It's just like uh, this uh, uh, five years uh, be here, is uh, we using also the post-mortem CT scanning for doing the identification of the dead body, uh, but first is for the screening. If there the body in the body bag there is a commingle uh, human remains or uh, there is um, so many jaws for the dental data, so we do the screening first with the postmortem CT scanning.
So it's an update things. Every every year we have a meeting, even uh, in Singapore, Interpol, or in Lyon, so uh, in France. So uh, this is uh, one from the, the Netherlands. They also doing the DVI quick scan injured. So it's more easier right now and more simpler. So we try to make it because uh, there is uh, too much. The form is too much. Um, uh, and, and uh, uh, depend on the disaster we have. Sometimes we don't need that much uh, form, but we only need one. Or sometimes it depends on the on the site of the disaster. Here uh, we have the uh, antemortem uh, quick form, and then the postmortem quick scan form from the Netherlands DVI team. And then the updating guide. I said like Indonesian have this yellow uh, yellow form of uh, for the postmortem. We can. See is um, uh, 2008 and then uh, 2013 and then we make it again uh, updating updating uh, also within the DNA itself uh, from the CODIS 13 to go to uh, identifier and everything so uh, it's going to be updating every every year and revise the protocol every five years and then uh, the the labeling of the dead bodies we, we got the uh, dead bodies from the side or from the scene, from the phase one, and going to us for the phase two, for the postmortem. So we do the, the labeling again within our uh, postmortem or the mortuary number. So sometimes because in one ba uh, body bag, there is two or three human remains. So when going to our postmortem uh, or the mortuary places, we have to divide it the number. Well, on each human remain or body parts we have. So from the scene, there, uh, there is a search and rescue team or the police or the army doing that or the voluntary, the volunteer people coming to do, just put everything in the body bag. So the number from the scene, it could be different with the number in the postmortem or in our mortuary. So it's uh, the thing that we should uh, take care of. So it's a uh, kind of different within the human remains or the property. We all divide it. It is animal, uh, human or non-human things. So uh, this is why we are have a comprehensive team of the expert of forensic within the forensic pathologists, forensic anthropologists and forensic odontologists and also the forensic science team for the photograph for the DNA, for the toxicology, and other uh, uh, laboratory testing. And here, in uh, we have this uh, tsunami uh, Banten because the Krakatau Mount eruption. Uh, so we first we have uh, we we uh, from the primary healthcare places uh, the the dead people were identified by the GP or general practitioner over there. And then it become the compost, or we haven't got the family who will uh, claim the body, and then we put it into the morgue, where we have to decide it in one the DVI operation team. But uh, uh, it could be um, first we going to do the go to the general uh, hospital, and also we can move it to. The more specific hospital where uh, the, the the DVI of the mortuary team or the postmortem team already set up. So uh, it depend on the 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 fast uh, operation or we have to delay a little bit the operation because the facility in that place is not um, supporting. So we have to put the facility first and then we can do the identification more properly. So always have to keep in mind, we doing this for the dignity and respect on the dead bodies or the human remain. So here, mortem office on the left side and the postmortem office on the right side is just the opposite between that two. It's uh, too close, but we can, we can put the the border uh, between it so the family cannot come to our postmortem places because something when uh, there is a um, panic uh, and also hysteria of the family they would like to come to to the mortuary just to see to do the visual identification 
but that is sometimes uh, they cannot uh, be visualized anymore because of the compost or because of uh, a kind of trauma like uh, washed by the seawater or uh, got uh, hit by the stone and everything in the earthquake. So it cannot be visualized anymore by the family. So we don't want that happen to, to make a bad memories to the family. So uh, the the releasing after we identify the body, it should be like that. But sometimes when we know there is a chaotic time, so uh, there is also we have to secure the places with the security and the police and everything with the we we seal it with the border and everything. So uh, here uh, we and the at the bottom data we collecting where people reporting the missing person and. And on the postmortem data, we do the, the record of the data of the human remains or the bodies. And here, uh, a big picture of our disaster. It happened in 2018. Uh, the earthquake first and then three minutes after this coming tsunami. And also, this is a, the very um, a rare thing, the, the liquefaction of the habitant. There are the, so the mud coming from the, the, the under uh, earth and then it's mixed up with the housing upper. So the, the thing that's upper, the housing and the people, is going uh, mixed up with the mud and the people are already uh, down, downside. So um, uh, it's just like the, we call it the instant muscle grief for the, for the liquefaction area in Palu, Dongkala, in central Sulawesi. But then all uh, the earthquake, uh, been, and then uh, three minutes after that, the tsunami. So the people near the seaside, actually at that time is Saturday, is going to make a festival where everybody uh, gathering over there and then suddenly the earthquake coming and then the tsunami, the water of the, uh, the sea is coming and wash them out to the, the sea. So uh, the, the dead victim, uh, uh, we have that guy uh, team in, in Palu, in uh, Bayangkara, in the police hospital, having these 2,081 dead victims. And we just doing that the open field mortuary. And the um, pathologist is not too much because the facility in that time is very uh, shut down. Uh, there is no electricity, there is no... Um, the, even the airport uh, cannot, uh, um, even the airport having the earthquake and uh, the, the air cannot land. And, and uh, uh, we only take the picture as much as possible. We added uh, about 1,122 victims and some of them were uh, taken or claimed by the family. But some of them, the family also vanished in that tsunami. So uh, we put it uh, all of the unclaimed victims or the dead body into the massa grave that government have made. And uh, um, so in this quick uh, of system of identification, we have to be quick also to change our system. We using the management of the dead body after disaster for the uh, first responder. Mostly we take the photograph of the victim. And uh, from the data of the Indonesian National Board Disaster and Countermeasure, actually, until now, there are still 1,309 missing birds that uh, we cannot uh, matching identify them uh, because maybe because uh, they already been buried in the muscle grip or because of the liquid faction itself. So here is uh, on the left side, we can see that the seawater and uh, there is uh, the moss, the, the floating moss, and still there uh, after the tsunami. But others building is washed out. Uh, on the right side, the picture is uh, because the earthquake and also liquefaction. And uh, this is the community. Actually, if you see that before, there is a housing and the people over there. They live there, but because the liquid faction and the mud, uh, the mix up with the upper side and also the underside going mix up, and so uh, that's what happened in in the uh, Tobo and Balaro.
it's sad because um, uh, we can smell the decomposed body, but we cannot found where is it. And uh, so uh, the the government uh, make it as a, a we not using that land anymore because it's very dangerous because of liquefaction. But we also make it this just like the instant mass master. And uh, what uh, my colleague do, this is uh, the, the team from uh, the Palu or Makassar uh, DVI team and also Indonesian national team. Uh, it's only a few people can uh, arrive there. So uh, we only took the photograph and uh, um, write a report, uh, a little bit report on it. So this is the open field mortuary. So we sometimes we, because of the victim is so many we don't have time because of the facility we don't have time to do that and to move it to the mock so we just do it on the field on site and this is uh, uh dr hasri she, she is uh, our forensic pathologist from indonesia she also a police and uh, she doing this uh, from the morning until the night and then the day after and uh, is a uh, the whole of the uh, in front and and on the of the hospital is full of the dead bodies is about 2000 dead bodies and uh, the survival or the other patient that's still alive is complaining of the smell of the decomposed body so that's why on the fourth day um uh, all these unclaimed victims or dead bodies go to the massal grave that government have placed here, uh, the place is uh, two weeks after the disaster. Me and Emilio come here, and there is in uh, in the middle is Dr. Eddie. He is in charge. If there is there is another victim that can uh, send to the mortuary in the police hospital, he will do the identification, and uh, of of course using the DVI form. And this is the mass grave. This is we can see on the left side. This is a liquid faction. So people may be under here because uh, the, you cannot see any housing um, uh, were standing anymore. And then on the right side is the, the massal grave places in uh, Palu. Here the second, uh, second disaster is a close disaster. We, uh, we call it Lion Air Crest. It's uh, also happening uh, after the tsunami Palu. And we have this second disaster, an airplane disaster. From the manifest, is there's a 189 passenger and crew, and only 125 victims identified using the Interpol DVI guide, mostly by DNA. Um, in this, uh, uh, is crashed into the sea, and we have to do diving to get the human uh, remains over there. Uh, the diver from the Navy and the volunteer doing that a morning until night, until the evening to, to get the body remains. And it's about uh, two to three weeks. And uh, uh, here we still have 64 missing person. And in dental, in the uh, first week, we cannot find any human remains that we can conclude it as a dental remains. So uh, the human remains is a very small pieces on it. And uh, after updating one to two weeks, and then uh, the family that uh, don't have uh, any um, claiming of the human remains, they also paying the diver to find out a, another human remains. And it's found out. Uh, and we can uh, identify another two person by the DNA itself. So uh, it's a big operation and very exhausting operation. We, we have this uh, one diver die because of the, um, we call it parotrauma. This is because uh, he is willing to do the work too much and um, he got the decompression, this is and die. And here we have the collecting antemortem data office in Jakarta because the Lion Air, uh, the, the first place is in, in, um, in Jakarta to go to the Bangka Island, to Belitung Island. So uh, we 
help we ask the family to to come to Jakarta to collect the anti-mortem data of the passenger that claim for um, as we see here is uh, the office also for the DNA laboratory for the DVI team in uh, Bayangkara Kramatjati Hospital in Jakarta so uh, we also uh, it's very easy to do the collecting of the DNA sample in this Room. Also on the corner, we have the psychologist and also the religion leader to do the psychologist's uh, uh, guidance to the family who cannot, cannot accept or having these mental problems after the, uh, hearing the information of the disaster itself. So here, uh, I'm doing the collection of the anti-mortem data, but we're doing it more simplified because uh, because uh, it's uh, happening in the morning and then in the afternoon the family already coming but actually they don't bring anything so we cannot we cannot record anything or we cannot collect anything so we ask them to take a rest in the hotel because the airline giving a hotel room for the family to stay and then we are uh, uh, if they got uh, some uh, data from the missing person from the hometown they can give us the day tomorrow is uh, but we do the the DNA swap the DNA uh, collecting sample for this family first before they they looking for another data here uh, we simplify the form of the DVI uh, Interpol uh, guidelines uh, become uh, one um, simple paper and also here is uh, only uh, for the anti-mortem data is only one simple paper as well for the the secondary identification the, the jewelry the t-shirt or the glasses they're wearing the last time or the ring and other medical data they have the implant and then the the dental chart is uh, to make uh, the family easier even we ask them to call the the dentist if uh, the missing person have been to dentist or uh, regularly here, the manifest of the passenger and crew, we got it from the Lion, uh, Lion Air itself. And uh, here, the, the third is the Sunda Tsunami, uh, Sunda Strait Tsunami. It happened also on the third month after the Lion Air disaster. So uh, before that, we call it our uh, country is the hypermark of the disaster. And uh, here, the eruption of the Krakatoa mountain and um, uh, there is also the tsunami and uh, uh, was the, the Lampung Island and also in the Banten area. So I'm working as a DVI in Banten province. That's uh, the thing I'm looking uh, I'm working in the post-mortem uh, um, uh, mortuary in the Banten hospital. So we have these 238 dead bodies uh, and 217 identified. The rest is uh, we, we put it in. In the, and we put the number on it. If uh, someday the family could claim and uh, matching data with our postmortem data, and then we can we can exhumate again and we give it to the family. It depends on the family where they are going to bury or where they are going to cremate the remains after it's match and release. And the identification we using both uh, at the first in the primary healthcare places. They are doing this the management of the death of the disaster for the first responder because we still not arriving there and we just waiting for the command from our DVI commander right now is Dr. Lisa DDS and uh, where is the places we going to do the examination for the dead bodies so the general practitioner in the primary health care can release the bodies if there is a matching uh, from the data of the family it's uh, only um, the superficial and fees identification by the family. But after that, if uh, there are already uh, none of the claim or we, we just uh, bring the family to, to claim the body after we do the post-mortem examination in our hospital for all the team of the DVI operation itself, uh, mostly it's a forensic expert and we using the Interpol DVI guide. So after that, uh, we still uh, there are still 77 missing persons we don't know are they in that uh, places or not because it's uh, the Christmas uh, holiday 
and everybody going to stay in the hotels. And after that, after staying there, uh, suddenly the the tsunami coming from the sea. So um, the mostly of uh, the party people in the in the seaside is was away by the tsunami. Here, as I said, already said, we have this antemortem and postmortem office in the Banten province of Bigotel in Pandeglang. And uh, here, uh, actually, uh, we uh, nowadays in 2016, 2000, 2015, we already have this uh, postmortem CT scanning for the dead bodies in uh, Bayangkara Hospital in Jakarta. So actually, from the MH17 in uh, doing the examination in Netherlands in Hilversum in Den Haag, uh, uh, the the dead bodies that were stained from uh, CT, scan, CT scanning first for the screening versus we screening the body bag or the coffin for the is there any missile or any um, um, ballistic or something is harmful for the postmortem team to do the examination. So there is in Hilversum in the in the mor mortuary in the front of the mortuary there is a, a big container trap and uh, there's containing the CT scanning and uh, the coffin uh, being screening first. And then we know uh, how many uh, dead bodies or property in the coffin. And after that, opening the coffin and uh, we have to screen it the biohazard or the new things before we put it in the post-mortem or the, the mortuary inside for the identification of the team. Uh, what I say is uh, labeling again when we have this coffin or we have the body bags uh, full of body remains or commingle. Uh, we do the, the labeling again one by one. And if there is a property, not a human remains, we can uh, labeling with the property. If the color is depend on your, your place is what you want to, to make the color on it. It's just to make it more here to differentiate the things we, we, we do. This is uh, what I'm doing for the workshop usually. We do the DVI workshop in everywhere. If you need us, we can do that. We are in from the AVOR, Association for Forensic Odontology for Human Rights. We can do the DVI workshop for your institution or your university or, or your country if you needed us. And uh, here uh, we do the uh, human remains. We do the tech and then uh, also the do the different labeling on it. Here, the yellow, uh, the pink form for the the postmortem identification recording. Here, the first is I, I say is primary identification. We are doing the fingerprint identification. So the first team after we do the postmortem CT scanning for the screening, we the first team to come to the table of the morph is the fingerprint team. They are doing this fingerprint. Thing. It's already identified, so we can we can put this that bodies to the other side. So it's already identified, and we can call the family after we do the matching uh, on the reconciliation. So uh, it's more easier. We do all the, the tsunami cases in Banten. We mostly is uh, ninety percent we doing the fingerprinting because there's uh, the fresh body in uh, in our mortuary for the fingerprint and. And then uh, 17 years old, we all of us in Indonesia citizen have to record our fingerprints. So it's more easier because we have the database of each people in our country. If the fingerprinting still can be retrieved. But if not, and the second team, it could be the dental, forensic odontologist to come in there. And uh, also the photograph, the forensic radio, uh, the forensic photography is always uh, um, in the whole process in the mortuary. Uh, the second is the forensic odontology. They do the recording on the dental chart of the uh, ping form of the DVI protocol. And then uh, sometimes we also found there is not the human. This is the cat. And also the search and rescue team put it, just put it in the body bag. So we are the one who, who should um, differentiate and labeling the, the things that human or non-human 
human. Here, human remains, if uh, there is only skeletons and human remains, uh, it will be a lecture tomorrow by Professor Hemlata Pande on the, the role of the forensic odontologist and uh, for human remains itself. And uh, here, uh, this is the, the doing for the DNA. Sometimes we took it from the very inner muscle inside the body that not contaminate with other outside things. So uh, sometimes we also took the long bones and about uh, two centimeters to 10 centimeters to take the collection for the DNA uh, laboratory. Here, uh, we uh, take in the, the sample and also as we see, it's different, different, uh, um, different uh, way of uh, decompose of the dead body. So here is skeletonized, and here is other there. So uh, we have to do. Uh, we be recording the, the secondary identification, such as the shirt and everything. And so sometimes the family will send us the picture of the last time because. All uh, right now, we all have a smartphone, and sometimes we go to the airport, or we go to the work, we take the selfie, and we send it to the the family. It's uh, actually is a um, um, it's good. So if uh, you are mostly sometimes missing, so you better do that the selfie things, a picture for the outfit today to the family, and send it to the family. It might be uh, it's a um, very useful if a suddenly disaster happened. So here I took the long bone uh, or the muscle inside to take the DNA, uh, DNA collection sample. Here uh, is also, I, I, I asked the team, uh, this is the, the students of the forensic pathology in the third year. They, they also uh, uh, try to retrieve the long bone from the, the hand of these uh, children. Uh, to check the DNA collection. This is uh, the uh, well, before the COVID-19 uh, time or pandemic, uh, we do the level two or class two PPE, personal uh, protection equipment. But right now we have to do the level three. If there is disaster happen or we doing the autopsy, we assume every dead body is a confirmed positive COVID-19. So we have to do, in the pandemic time, we do the level three or the class three uh, PPE. Is uh, Before the COVID-19, we can just use this and also the mask and the glove. Only that is enough to do the identification. But right now, because of the pandemic, we have to do the upper level on it. Uh, also using maybe the FFP3 uh, and uh, also the the mortuary should be in HEPA filter or, or the negative pressure mortuary is uh, because of this pandemic. It might be happening until uh, the end of December 2021, I think. We have to do that for the safety of uh, ourselves and the safety of our team. And also, don't forget, we have to do the briefing on the uh, joining the PPE and also the most important thing is the doving, the, the take off of the PPE itself. We, we shall do not contaminate the area and not contaminate our team and also not contaminate ourselves because one uh, person confirmed as a COVID-19 um, disease. So our team is... This is a uh, we labeling and we send it to the laboratory. This is Dr. Uh, uh, Putut. Uh, he is the, the head of the DNA laboratory in DVI, uh, uh, national DVI team. And uh, here the release of the identify body because majority Indonesia have um, um, uh, Islamic religion. So mostly we do the cup to the dead body so we have to do the prayer and everything sometimes we do it sorry we do it in uh, in the mortuary itself here uh, sometimes because the chaotic in the first day uh, the family coming to the mortuary and try to identify themselves by visual and then after they open the body bag they were shocked because they cannot see what what the visualize anymore because 
it's already it is very uh, greenies and the big and the smelly and everything. So uh, we have to do the secure area of our places. Here, uh, if uh, there is um, the dead body, we're going to stand outside the the morgue or the town of the disaster happen because mostly people coming and uh, coming out, coming out, coming in, coming out, and then maybe. Maybe the urban or the tourists coming and then a disaster happen and we have to send them back to the hometown. We do the embalming or with the contamination of the dead body by doing the formaldehyde uh, solution on the dead bodies. This is just a minor surgery kit we need. And this is the babies. Uh, we do the also the, uh, we just found it the artery femoralis or also we can do the injection of the uh, uh, in, uh, on the the uh, area from the the lungs and everything from the organ, it depends on the way of you doing the embalming. As long as is uh, disinfection, uh, we doing the disinfection and doing the dead contamination of the dead bodies, and it is uh, safe to do to the transporting from the one place to the hometown. We do it all what for respect and dignity in the compassion and uh, respect and comfort to the family for they making this early grieving is smoothly is the best because uh, sometimes uh, if uh, they already get shocked uh, by uh, the compost body and everything and then they're going uh, problem with their mental health so uh, here uh, we not only doing the identification but we try to do to avoid with the mental health of the family. That's why we have the corner for the psychologist and the leader of the religion to, to do the guidance uh, to them. Maybe uh, uh, just listening to what they want to share and also we guidance them to do the meditation and everything. Here, sometimes a family would like to do uh, the ceremony or the funeral ceremony of the dead. Uh, so we also can provide what they need. We try to provide what they need. Here, uh, our uh, DVI commander, Dr. Lisa Cancer, DDS. She's uh, uh, always. Uh, we always do the press conference each uh, each evening after the uh, the examination. And here uh, on the right side is uh, our places to do the postmortem recording in the mortuary in Jakarta. And uh, sometimes I also do uh, the uh, real, uh, public uh, awareness, what uh, the family need to bring to our anti-mortem office and why family have to wait some time uh, to, to claiming the dead bodies because we're doing this matching. Sometimes uh, the human remains is so bad, only a small part, so we getting on the DNA and it takes time for the DNA. So after that uh, match, we can release. But uh, sometimes it's need. Um... So uh, this is uh, the conclusion of the procedure in the mortuary. First is the team itself for the uh, mortuary team. It's forensic pathologist, forensic radiologist, forensic odontologist, forensic anthropologist, forensic scientist is a DNA team. Toxicology team. Why toxicology? Because when there is an airplane crash, uh, we have to assume that the pilot is uh, some have something on um, uh, that makes the airplane crash. So we also do this uh, laboratory examination, but for the certain cases only. Uh, usually, mostly is we do it for the fast for identification only. And uh, of course, the forensic photography, the photographer man is always around us because we have to take more picture, more picture and more picture to do the release in the reconciliation time. And uh, right now we're doing the, before uh, COVID-19, we do the level two PPE, but right now until December 2021, I hope we're all doing the level three PPE to do uh, identification thing or to do Examination in the mortuary. 
And the uh, first is the labeling the body bag in the mortuary number, different, see? And uh, the, the body bag, we, we put the number of the mortuary and then we scanning first. Scanning, it depends on the facility in your place. Uh, sometimes you don't have the CT scanning, it's also fine. But uh, the, the right now, this update of BVI Interpol protocol is we do the, uh, the post-mortem CT scanning for screening first. This is the common mingle biohazard or something uh, dangerous for the mortuary people inside if we, we just open the, the body bag uh, and without the screening. And then after that, we open and labeling the human body remains. And now, because the COVID-19 era, our pandemic, we do the swap of nasopharyngeal. The, uh, some uh, hospital, I think the Dallas Hospital in USA, they using this uh, swap nasopharyngeal first. And after that, they're waiting for the RT-PCR results. Before, uh, during that time, the, the dead people is just put it in the fridge. And they're do not doing anything. After they know this is uh, uh, negative, they can do uh, the examination uh, or the autopsy right away. But if uh, it's uh, uh, the positive, so they have to do the decontamination and everything. So, uh, and then after that, labeling the human body remains, uh, if there is the, 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 the body or the human remain is still good, um, visualize, uh, we can ask the forensic odontologist first to do the dental charging and the x-ray uh, of the dental. Usually, right now, the, the technology, they have the portable x-ray for the panoramic and, and others uh, picture. And uh, after that, the, the second team is the forensic pathology and forensic anthropology to do uh, all the recording, the, the primary recording and the secondary recording. Uh, don't forget the uh, the fingerprinting team before, and then uh, uh, after we do the uh, uh, identification within the forensic pathology and anthropology. Of course, we take the sample for collecting the sample for DNA and also toxicology. Sometimes we are the forensic pathologists who doing the collection of the sample. Well, we have the team from the laboratory who do the retrieving of the la uh, collection uh, of the sample. It depends on the, how many person or how many facility you, you have and you need. And then the, the last is embalming. If we need to bring the uh, bodies uh, or the human remains to the hometown. And um, after that, we release to the family. So uh, the conclusion is the mass disaster essential for identification. And then the DVI operation team in the field using the even that uh, the DVI manual protocol or even the, is, is the ICRC protocol is uh, fine. It depends on your uh, timing, your facility, and your, your personnel. Uh, but the better is the best is for the completely identification is, of course, for us, the expert, is using the Interpol protocol guidelines for, for DVI. And uh, here are the references, the ICRC book and also the DVI protocol. You can get it the PDF form by the internet. Just type it or if you don't get it, you can ask uh, email to us and we, we can send it to you. Of course, by forwarding. This is uh, from our team in Indonesia. Uh, we, uh, our team is uh, from uh, the whole Indonesia within the universities and the the police headquarters, and also we have the forensic pathologists within the city, okay. also forensic pathologists of the police. So when disaster happens, we are together. We are together, we're working as soon as possible. Uh, I'm just going to take a question one by one from the participant. So first question I'm going to take from uh, Professor Goria. Sir, over to you. Uh, hello. Good afternoon, everybody. It was a very nice presentation, Dr. Evie, and we are pleased that we know a lot about it. But what is your experience about the surgical implants in, uh, uh, while examining the dead body? And uh, help, the, are these helping in identification? Yes, because the, the plate and screw sometimes have the number. And also the family can go to the hospital where they're having this operation of the plate and screw. They can ask the orthopedic surgeon 
to, to retrieve the number from the medical record. And we can match it with the implant of the pet and screw and the fracture body of the missing person that identify the uh, mortuary. So uh, if it is matching the number, we can release the body. Thank you very much. Uh, Ivita, no. next question is from the Satyajit Raje. Which part of the body is used to take a sample for DNA isolation for identification? PM. It depends. I, as, as I said in the first, in, uh, we can do the deep muscle in the body. It, usually we use the psoas muscle uh, because it's uh, rare of contamination because it's inside. It's uh, on the back of uh, our reproductive uh, organ. And also the second is the long bone. It depends on the facility in your laboratory of DNA, which is uh, more easier for them to, to do the, um, the, what we call it, the PCR, the everything, the, screen, the sequencing and the reagent they have, which one is the best. But uh, right now the Tiazen can do everything. Uh, the teeth, uh, usually we're using the molar third for the teeth for the DNA retrieve. And also we have the long bone. In our, uh, in our laboratory DNA, uh, Dr. Putu love to use uh, the long bone. We take it two centimeter until 10 centimeter of the long bone. It is, it is already contain the DNA. So it depends on uh, the facility in your place, but the best is uh, uh, the, the muscle or the long bone. And uh, the, for the teeth is that uh, need uh, more time to retrieve the DNA in the pulp. So, but the dentin also have the DNA. So it depends on, on the facility, on the reagent, uh, on the sequencing uh, machine in your places. It depends. Just, just coordinate, just asking the, the laboratory, uh, head of the laboratory, which uh, sample they like us to do. So that's it. Yeah. So second question is from Parul Singh. How can we collect the bite mark in anti-mortem cases where uh, accept photography? Bite marks? It's a question for Dr. Neeraj actually. Uh, yeah. Dr. Neeraj can answer this question. Dr. Neeraj. Professor Goria also can answer this question. Yes. Mm -hmm. How can we collect the bite mark in anti-mortem cases except photography? Uh, if the bite marks are deep, I told that the uh, rubber-based light body putty can be used to collect it in anti-mortem cases. In case we get that and we, we reach the place on time, I mean within few minutes, few uh, important minutes, in that time we can uh, you know use the rubber-based putty to collect it. Otherwise, there are other techniques like machines and all uh, that day we discussed. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Dr. Evi, next question is, if there are a bunch of dead bodies, like uh, 2,000 or more, then uh, how they manage to conduct a post-mortem of all bodies and how much time they require, how they manage the situation? It depends on our team and our facility. Yeah. Uh, we, if we have this kind of big disaster and we have uh, the, the facility in that, we're just calling all the, the experts from all over Indonesia to come. And we divide it into 10 or 15 teams. So uh, one team doing one uh, dead body. So in, in one day, we usually we do the ex, uh, examination is from the morning, uh, like uh, 8 a.m. in the morning. We do the briefing first for the team because sometimes we have the other expert from other places. So we have to do the same perception first for the team, which is the, he is a forensic pathologist or forensic DNA or forensic anthropology. So it's a one team, maybe three person for one dead body. It's also, uh, don't forget the forensic odontologist as well in this uh, uh, examination. So uh, it depends uh, on the, if uh, we have 2,000 dead bodies, but uh, we have all the facility in that time and we can, sorry, uh, could you, some people not muting the microphone, so my my voice my voice is not audible if you not mute the microphone. I'm sorry. Please kindly mute your microphone, otherwise if you want to ask him something. So uh, the, um, we divide it into the the team, but it depends on the facility and the expert in your places. It could be take times, maybe one week or even four weeks. Uh, 
from each day if, uh, if we have much team if we only have four team then uh, we doing the examination from 8 to 12 o'clock usually every day maybe we can only um, doing the retrieve the data in the postmortem is about maybe 15 to 20 it depends on the, the, the experience and the, the fast collection of your team. It depends. It could be uh, uh, if uh, there is 2,000 dead bodies, but it's visually can be identified uh, faster. We can do it maybe two weeks or one week. But um, all the things depend. We, we cannot we cannot put time. We have to do it, um, but we have to do it uh, fast, uh, uh, efficient, and effective, and also with respect and dignity. So it depends on the facility, the expert team in your place, and the experience, how they can manage the time of the examination and reconciliation. The, the, usually we have this uh, long uh, discussion is in the reconciliation class, because sometimes there is a match in dental, but it is matched in secondary identification. That's what make us uh, uh, discuss more. Can we release this body within the secondary identification? But uh, the the primary is not too match. So that's uh, the point of uh, um, releasing uh, the dead body to the uh, exact identify person. Thank you, Dr. V. Uh, next question is from Dr. Sarmila uh, Gurung. CT scan of the body while in body bag. I missed the purpose and its objective. So can you explain again the CT scan, purpose of the CT scan uh, of the body? While the in body scanning. bag. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, the body bag put inside the CT scan. First, it's actually for screening. Is there how many bodies inside? Or the in, in uh, for MF7 in case? Is this is screening, is there any biohazard that can be harm to the, the mortuary people or the team? So uh, there have two purposes. One is for screening the biohazard. Second is for screening uh, the, the how many dead bodies or uh, is there inside we have the dead bodies or not, or only property. Because sometimes the search and rescue team just put everything in the body bag but we cannot find any uh, human remains inside. Like in uh, Sukai, Sukhoi Superjet, in one body bag is only the, the fan or uh, the things from the airplane. We cannot find any human remains. So we, uh, first is we do the CT scanning to do to finding the biohazard or even see it is uh, any body, uh, human remains or body, or uh, we, we looking for is there many human remains inside. So it's also actually for the recording for the CT scanning, but um, the, main, uh, the main idea is for screening. But for me, which is I learned in the forensic radiology, is also we can record the things that uh, if uh, there's uh, the shot, go, uh, shot one and everything, we can find the, the, the bullets uh, within the CT scanning first. So the purpose is um, uh, for the medical is having a purpose and also for the, the security. Uh, next question is from uh, Jafar. Uh, in water submerged body, did fingerprint get distorted? So no, it is not get distorted. It depends upon the uh, how uh, after how many days you are going to develop the fingerprint. Next question is from uh, Priyanka Singh. Which method do you use to take the fingerprint for the dead body? So primarily we used to take the uh, ink method for the uh, dead body. And if the dead body is one or two days old, we used to take the scanning method. We have the real time scanners and uh, uh, we convert that into the uh, FS form or if the country giving the database, we can match that fingerprint the database. And if the country is not having the database, we request to give uh, arrange the antimatrim database and we can develop the uh, fingerprint from the available antimatrim report like a book uh, or a last cast uh, any material from where we can develop the fingerprints so thank you uh, next question uh, uh, from paula magni do you guys have a forensic entomology service over there ah uh, we not yet having these uh, forensic entomologists 
but we have uh, people who interested in that uh, major. So maybe next year uh, there is some uh, of the forensic specialists from Indonesia will be sending to Malaysia to study the forensic entomology. Yeah. But um, we until now we not having uh, the uh, um, uh, not focusing on our. Uh, um, examination the uh, entomology thing like uh, we have this larva in the decomposed body we just uh, measure it and we just uh, can uh, doing the general is that the, the dead body is already three days four days before uh, it uh, found it so it's only that yeah so before taking a next question I'll request Dr. Hemlata Pandey and Dr. Neera sir also read the question if I miss any question you can ask in between so the next question, if the body recognized by yeah. uh, the cert of the X uh, exhibit, is the uh, secondary identification enough to identify the unidentified body? Sorry, can, can we... Uh, so I'd like to answer this, uh, uh, Dr. Vashim. Yes, on the basis of cert, only on the basis of cert, it's very tough to give the uh, identification. But yes, if we are not getting a similar kind of cert in any other exhibit, definitely we can give... Uh, identification through the secondary identifier but if a same brand assert we are finding on the two different bodies then uh, we require the other identification features am i correct tv sorry yeah so second question if we, uh, next question is do pandemic disease is spread because of the postmortem procedure do what pandemic pandemic disease is spread because of pm procedure it means the pandemic spreading or what? Yeah, question is do pandemic disease spread because of PM procedures? In the mortuary, you mean? Yeah. Oh, until now, we don't have that uh, proof that uh, there is a forensic uh, team or forensic pathologist going get the confirm of the COVID-19 from the dead bodies or from the disease. Uh, but before for the inspectant or the, the contamination before we do the, the examination actually. We do the disinfectant uh, spray on the dead bodies before we do the examination. So actually, uh, and we do the level 3 of PPE, it's making us more safe and secure for doing the examination. Uh, Ranjit, there's one question from uh, Dr. Sudhanshu Tripathi. Sir, is any such type of organization is operating in India for disaster victims? I think we have a national disaster management team and state disaster. But do we have anything like disaster victim identification? Ranjit, you can answer that. Uh, which, sir? Uh, do we have a disaster victim identification uh, system in this, in, sir, uh, in uh, India? Because we sir, have the procedure is not disaster. the same in our country. Uh, it is different uh, in our country and it comes under the okay. uh, State Disaster yeah. Management Authority wherein uh, they appoint uh, um, teams of forensic uh, medicine experts to do this work and it is based on what uh, region the disaster will be in. Yeah, so uh, uh, I'm just adding to uh, Dr. Hemrita Pandey ma'am uh, statement. So we have a, a NDRF and SDRF, but for particular such kind of disaster and identification of body through the postmortem and other reports, so we uh, generally the uh, states call their regional expert. Like if uh, 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 just an example, one disaster taken place in the airport area where the one plane crash happened. So Dr. Adars and team from the Ames was called for the identification of the body. So it depends upon the reason to the reason. If some kind of identification is required in Mumbai, definitely mm -hmm. it, uh, uh, state will refer to the Dr. Hemlata Pandey and uh, their team. Am I correct, madam? Uh, sir, again in Mumbai, because uh, it's a metropolitan city, we have four government medical colleges right now okay. in our region. So uh, again, it will be divided on the zone. So Each hospital is in one zone. And if something happens in that zone, uh, then uh, that hospital will be uh, given the case. And if it is uh, a mass disaster, then uh, uh, doctors from other hospitals will also be involved. But uh, it is usually done locally uh, in that region. May I add something? Yes, please, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, because whenever the postmortem examination is being done, uh, so it is the duty of the forensic pathologist to identify the dead body. So, so far in India, it is the uh, forensic pathologist who is mainly 
identifying the dead body and it is one of the aims and objectives of doing the post mortem examination so yeah. there, there is no separate thing like uh, identification team uh, if a post mortem is being done by forensic pathologist he is to identify and if he cannot do it he is to take the help from the other persons a uh, fingerprint experts or forensic odontologist or anybody he thinks fit Yes. yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Abby, Abby, uh, what's your take on virtual autopsy? Yeah, that is a question I'm about to take. Sorry. What's uh, your take on a virtual autopsy? Virtual autopsy. Please virtual throw some light autopsy? on autopsy. Virtual autopsy. Virtual yeah. autopsy on what? Why? What's the question? Virtual autopsy. What's your take on virtual autopsy? Virtual is virtual autopsy? autopsy carried out? Is virtual autopsy carried out for identification? Yes, of course. Uh, from the post mortem CT scanning, we also can do the uh, identification, such as we can uh, we can measure the frontal sinus and also the uh, the the sinus and the maxillaries. We also can uh, matching with the the picture of uh, before they have taken the uh, the skull uh, picture uh, when they uh, still alive. So uh, every every. Uh, Every morning, by the technology and by the manual, by the forensic uh, pathology or forensic radiologist, of course, we can retrieve all the recording to do the matching uh, of the identification. So I think uh, we have covered all the questions. And if we have missed any question, we'll uh, take through the chat, uh, uh, recover through the chat, and we'll add that question into the blog. And if anyone have any question, they can uh, directly write to the email also or send to on our WhatsApp to Dr. Sunil or to me. And we'll compile all the questions along with your answers from the different experts of the panel. Thank you, Dr. Avi, for the uh, nice presentation and taking all the questions.